Thank you so much for joining us for Church Online this morning. Good morning to all of our friends in the local Southern Maryland area. Good morning to our friends that are joining in from around the country and even maybe from around the world. We are so excited that you are here with us this morning. My name is Jen and I am part of the team here at South Point Church. And for those of you that don't know me, I have been married to my husband for 20 years. We have four kids together, ranging in ages from 11 to 19. You guys, is anyone else super bummed that we didn't get together this past Friday night? I know that I am, but you know what? That just means that when we get together on the 31st, it'll just be all that much more exciting and fun, and we'll get to hang out together in just a couple of weeks. Today, we're kicking off a new series called Homemade. Homemade is going to be a series about parenting and how to make your home a better place for your families. Now, when you look at this image, what pictures does it create in your mind? For me, I'm like, ah, oh, it's a pie. It makes me think of all the great things that my mom made for us growing up. You guys, my mom, she's a saint. Like, I'm pretty sure she was literally sainted and just never told us. And so when I look at this image, I'm like, ah, oh, that's so great. But then the flip side of that is that I think about all the things that I am not all the places that I don't measure up. My mom made homemade meals for every single meal of our entire life. I mean, I never had a cold breakfast before I went to school. My mom got up, she would make biscuits and eggs and bacon and gravy like every single morning. And so she took this time to make us our food and me as an adult, like I'm not doing that. We, we never had cold cereal on a morning where maybe she didn't feel good. We had oatmeal. And I'm not talking like instant oatmeal where you open a packet. I'm talking like old-fashioned oats where she stood over the stove and stirred it. Um, in our house, I keep my freezer stocked with Eggo waffles, a whole lot of sausages on a stick, all the things that my kids can just throw together for themselves. I'm not the parent that my mom was. And there's a whole lot of guilt and shame that I live with every day of Man, all the ways that I don't measure up. I didn't even know what TV dinners were until I was in middle school. I went to um, Texas with a friend of mine. We lived in Arkansas, and uh, her grandma gave us money to go to the store and was like, you guys go buy some food for yourselves. In Arkansas, we didn't walk anywhere because it was super rural, um, but we walked to the grocery store, and I found this aisle in the grocery store, and this aisle was full of meals, like they were already cooked and they were frozen and you just had to put them in the microwave. And I was so excited to get back to the house and call my mom and be like, mom, you don't ever have to cook for us again. Guess what? They have these meals, they're called TV dinners and they're already prepared for you. And my mom was like, yeah, we're, we're not gonna be having that food. And I was like, I, I don't understand. Like you're gonna save yourself so much time. But to my mom preparing home cooked meals for our family, was super important. I love my kids. It's just not that important to me. There are other ways that I care for them. But seeing this picture makes me think of ways that I might not measure up. And it adds on a little bit more guilt and a little bit more shame. And so today we're going to talk about guilt and shame. I've noticed a common connection with parents that I've met. There's this common thread that we have of we all have ways that we don't measure up. We all have guilt and shame that we're carrying in this parenting journey. And so when I say we're gonna talk about parenting, if you're not a parent, please don't dial down, please don't walk away, please don't be like, oh, this isn't for me. There is something in this for you because even if you're not a parent, I'm sure you have ways of guilt and shame that you're carrying around. I, and maybe you know some kids or you know some parents and you have this unique position where you can lean into their lives and you can support them and you can walk with them along this journey to help lift the guilt and shame that they're carrying. So we all have this monster in our lives and this monster is called the not enough monster. Sometimes this monster just whispers things into our ears, all the ways that we don't add up, all the things that we're not doing right, all the ways that our friends and our families and everybody online are doing what we're doing so much better than us. And sometimes this monster shouts really, really loudly into our lives. And it can be really hard to shut it down and be like, okay, I am me, 
I am not that person. And so we all have moments where this not enough monster shows up in our lives. Young, old, married, divorced, widowed, separated, parents, grandparents, non-parents, male, female. I'm pretty sure that no matter where you're watching from this morning, you have a not enough monster in your life and it can take up residence and take over if we're not real careful. And so as we talk about this not enough monster, I wanna give you a little bit of my story so that you can understand how this not enough monster has like started out just like coming for visits and now has can take over and um, kind of grab the steering wheel and take hold of my life. Um, so before I start off, let me just tell you that before I had kids, I was the perfect parent. I knew it all. I had read all the books. I knew all the things that you should do. If you had a situation with your kid, I knew how to fix it. I was the perfect parent. I was going to become a parent and I was going to nail this. I was gonna show all the parents out there how this was done. I was going to be the perfect parent. For the baby phase, I was gonna have a natural labor, no drugs, I'm strong and fierce and I can do this. now. Before you get upset with me in the chat and type that all, um, all birth is real, please remember, this was before I had kids, so I was practically an expert. I had had ultrasounds, but we were choosing not to find out what the gender of the baby was because we wanted that perfect delivery room moment. I was going to exclusively, exclusively breastfeed. I was only going to use name brand diapers because that's the best and that's what you use. And also, this was before there were so many cool options for cloth diapers, so if that had been an option, I probably would have taken that too. So, flashback, I'm 21 years old, I'm married, I'm pregnant. It, it's just gonna be perfect. We are going to have the perfect life. So, one evening, it was a Friday evening, I go into labor. Don't worry, I'm not gonna get into all the gory details. Um, and I'm at the hospital, and things are pretty hectic and crazy. If you've ever been at the hospital, you understand that. And I remember laying there and kind of looking up the, at the monitors and realizing this isn't like it happened in all the books that I read. Something is very different. And so right about that time, um, someone, a medical professional, I'm not sure who it was, handed me a clipboard and they said, ma'am, we need you to sign this consent form. You're gonna have to have a C-section. And I was like, Psh, I'm not having a C-section. Like, this is all natural, I've got this. And so I like tossed the clipboard back at them and they kind of, forcefully put it back into my lap and they said, ma'am, if you don't sign this paper, you and your baby will both be dead within half an hour. And I was like, whoa, like it's not supposed to happen that way, but okay. So obviously I'm here today, my daughter's here today. Obviously I signed the papers. So the next thing I remember is they bring me to, because remember, if you don't have an epidural and you need a C-section, you get the pleasure of having a general anesthesia. So. They bring me to and they say, ma'am, we had some issues. Um, the baby is not doing well. And so if you look right outside that door over there, you'll see the isolate. They're gonna wheel the baby by on the way to an ambulance and they've gotta take them to um, a hospital across town that has more medical care than we can provide at this hospital. And so I was like, okay, so I'm laying there like super groggy. The isolate comes by, I don't really see anything. And then it keeps going. And um. After it went by, I remember looking up and I remember saying, well, was it a boy or was it a girl? Like, what happened? You guys, 30 minutes into this parenting gig, the guilt and the shame, it just starts creeping in and it's growing. And I'm sitting in this hospital room, probably laying all by myself because my husband and family obviously had gone to be with the baby, which is the right thing to do there. Um, but who strolls into my room? This not enough monster. And he is there hanging out and he is telling me all the ways that I have failed my baby 24 hours into her birth. Fast forward a few weeks, we're able to bring her home. Um, a few days before we came home, I realized um, I was not gonna be able to breastfeed and so she was gonna have to be bottle fed. You guys, at that moment, the not enough monster shows up on my door, knocks pretty loudly and has a great big suitcase. And I'm like, oh man. Here we go. So here we are, 10 days into parenting of what I was going to be perfect at. I was gonna be the perfect mom. We were gonna have the perfect family and literally nothing had gone like I wanted it to. 
So they're like, you can take the baby home. So we bring the baby home and my husband are like, what? They're gonna let us take this baby home? We have no experience. We've, we've messed everything up so far. So um, how does this work out? So obviously I'm not gonna spend all morning telling you every detail of my life. Um, so we'll just suffice it to say, I have a 19 year old daughter. She's still here today. We haven't killed her yet. Um, she hasn't killed us yet. Um, sometimes she acts a little bit too much like her father, but I forgive them for that. So things are moving on. But the not enough monster made his presence known in our life. So I want each of you to think about some parents in your life and think about your own parenting journey if you're on this journey with me. Let's take a moment and walk through what this looks like in today's social media driven society. Someone finds out that they're pregnant, boom. All the sonogram pictures, the perfect gender reveal party, everything is on social media. And if you're not doing those things, it feels like you're not enough. The baby is born, all the perfect pictures. And if your baby is born in circumstances that are different or things don't go perfectly, that not enough monster grows and grows. Baby sits up, baby starts walking, first day of preschool, first day of elementary school, you can kind of get the picture. Like from the moment our kids are born, we're posting our highlight reel on social media. I don't know of anyone who ever posts, my baby was up all night crying all night long because they have colic. It's not part of our highlight reel. And so we can get these pictures of other people's lives. We tend to only see the perfect side. And so we're comparing ourselves to that. I'm sure you've all felt moments where you felt like you weren't the perfect parent. I'm sure we've all had moments where we felt like we weren't the perfect child. Maybe you've had moments where you weren't the perfect provider for your family or you weren't the perfect spouse. As our kids get older, somewhere around middle school, our dynamic with our kids changes. Yes, we're still the parent, but the relationship becomes more important than the positional authority we've always carried. See. With my two-year-old, I can tell them what to do, and they're mostly gonna do it because, well, I'm the mom and I'm 10 times taller than they are. I'm pretty sure with my rising eighth grader who is just two and a quarter inches shorter than me, but who's counting, um, I'm probably a little bit less intimidating to him. But it still feels like I am not enough. <clears throat> so I know 90% of what my middle schooler does. I would say 100%, but well, let's be honest, he's my third kid. Um, and I have learned that I'm not near the perfect parent that I thought I was before I had kids. Most of the 90% of things that I know about this kid are great, but there are also some things about him that I'm not gonna post on social media for the world to see. There are struggles that our family faces that we, we just don't put out there for everyone to see. And so I'm comparing our struggles to everyone else's highlights. Maybe you feel like you're the only parent who has a child facing whatever your child is facing. Maybe you feel like you're the only parent whose child is not getting straight A's. Maybe you feel like you're the only parent whose child is seeing a counselor and you feel like you have absolutely failed your children. Middle school is the phase in a kid's life where parenting becomes isolating and that guilt and that shame pile on a little bit more and that not enough monster grows and grows. By now, my not enough monster is living in the attic full time. <clears throat> this is also where our kids start to feel isolated. They're not maturing at the same rate as their friends. They have a friend who posted something about them on social media and now all of their friends don't like them. The not enough monster has also taken a hold of our children. After middle school, our kids move into high school and there is no such thing <clears throat> as a perfect teenager. If you know a teenager who is perfect, I would encourage you to lean in a little bit closer because you might not know them as well as you think you do. Parenting teenagers is the hardest phase I have ever encountered. I remember when my kids were strong-willed toddlers, I don't know where they got their strong will from, but I just remember thinking, man, when they're teenagers and I can like reason with them, this will be so much easier <laughs> Nobody ever told me that that was like the biggest lie ever. You see, something drastically changes when you're parenting your kids who are six inches taller than you, full on facial hair, and a voice that's deeper than their father's. The not enough monster has moved from the attic 
to Under My Bed, where we have regular nightly talks. And our kids are facing things we never dreamed of facing as teens. As a teenager, on a Friday night, if I didn't get invited to a party, I probably didn't find out about it until Monday. Now our kids are watching it play out in real time. They see the party happen, and they also see that they're the only ones who didn't get invited. If there's someone who didn't like you at school when you were a kid, when that bell rang at 2.45, you got the evening off. You didn't have to worry about it. You got to go home. And on Fridays, you got a two-day break. Our kids and teens these days, they don't get that break because they're always connected. So maybe you're thinking that you are a parent and you are nailing this parenting gig. And that's great. I, I think that's amazing. I'm not there. Um, but for 99% of parents, and that's probably a guess, um, I think we're all feeling some guilt and some shame. But I wanna sit here for a minute and talk about the difference between guilt and shame because in order to move on, I think we should be able to distinguish between the two of them. So guilt. Guilt is feeling bad about something that you do. Maybe you've done something wrong and you feel guilty about it. Maybe you are guilty, but I've never met a parent who didn't want to be a better parent. I truly believe that all parents are doing the best that they can. We talk about mom guilt quite a bit. Does anybody struggle with mom guilt? Like I do big time. And I'm sure there's also a dad version of this. We'll call it dad guilt. Um, we carry this guilt because we don't measure up as parents. We, we're not doing all of the things with our kids. In this corona season, my kids aren't being entertained by me 24 hours a day. Like I am working and my husband is working and we're just trying to figure it out. And that adds on to the guilt. The difference between guilt and shame is that while guilt is feeling bad about something that you do, Shame is feeling bad about who you are. It's a painful feeling that we appear to others and to ourselves, and it doesn't necessarily depend on having done anything. Shame is the not enough monster. Shame is compounded because we are so loosely connected on social media. Did you guys know we are raising the loneliest generation that we have ever raised? And if you wanna counter that, I would simply ask you, do you ever feel lonely? Do you as an adult ever feel like you're not enough or that you don't measure up or that you're missing out on things? I know that I do. And in that realm, I also refrain from posting things because I don't want others to feel like they don't measure up or they're not enough. But then when I don't post things, I'm like, man, this friend got 150 likes on their photo. I, I'm at zero. Um, it's just this never-ending cycle, and it truly feels like there is no way to win. And I'm processing all of this with a fully developed brain. I mean, mostly developed. Our teenagers are processing this, processing this with brains that are still developing. I think this is what makes the not enough monster so powerful in our lives. It poisons the deepest, most personal thoughts about ourselves. And parent, when parents live with the same, that they're not good enough, then their kids start to hang out with their own versions of the not enough monster. They have their own version of this monster that's looking into their lives. Depression, suicide, anxiety are at their highest levels that they've ever been. Our students feel inadequate. We as parents feel inadequate. How can we jump off of this inadequacy roller coaster? Friends, we have to stop. We have to stop this cycle of guilt and shame that parents are feeling, that our students are feeling, and that we are feeling. And in order to do that, we must do two important things, and we're going to address those two things today. The first thing that we have to do is we have to make it personal. Jesus made it personal. He came to prove that God loves humans. You are enough because Jesus says you're enough. In the midst of all of our struggles, Jesus is transforming us. We are enough because he says that we are enough. And this is such good news. I've learned um, that for, for me to feel like I'm enough, I need a couple of really close friends, friends that have kids in the same phase that I have. 
um, when we were younger, when my kids were younger, this was easier because I could put on Facebook, oh, my kid is struggling with this, how do I fix it? But as my kids get older, I can't put their struggles on Facebook. It's not my story to share anymore, it's theirs. And it also becomes um, this arena for other people to judge my kids and to maybe look down on them. And as a parent, like I can't, I can't provide that um, area for that to grow. And so when I have friends who I can lean into and say, you know what, like my kid is struggling with this, I don't know what to do. And sometimes like my friends can give me help, but sometimes my friend will say, you know what, my kids are facing that too. And when I lean in and when I make it personal and I can talk to people about this, that not enough monster, instead of growing and getting bigger, he starts to shrink and gets smaller. These feelings of guilt and shame that we as parents are feeling, they do not come from God. These feelings of guilt and shame, this not enough monster, it's because of our own brokenness. Jesus did not come to condemn. Jesus came to make it personal and to redeem. I love what Jeremiah 1.5 tells us. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. Let's stop for a moment and let that sink in. God made it personal. And if you ever wonder if you actually matter to God, I'm going to point you back to this verse. Before I formed you, I knew you. So not only does that mean that mean that God knows us, that God is for us, it also means that God knew what he was doing when he gave us these kids. He knew me before he formed me in the womb. And 19 years later, he knew my daughter before he formed her in the womb. God knew what he was doing. So when that not enough monster rears its ugly head in my life, we have to remind ourselves that God knew what he was doing. And not only did he know what he was doing, his grace is sufficient for me and his grace is sufficient for you. Now, if God, and you're not, if you're not sure what I mean when I say God, um, let's just rewind back a little bit um, to the beginning of the Bible. Genesis 1.1 tells us that God created the heavens and the earth. And so when I say that God's grace is sufficient for you, I am saying that the same God that spoke creation into existence, the same God that said, let there be light, and there was light. The same God that said, let dry ground appear, and the land appeared. The same God that said, let there be living creatures, and the animals appeared. This same God knew you before he formed you. God made it personal. You see, the, enti the entire first chapter of Genesis, God spoke things into creation. I speak a lot of words, you can ask my husband, but I've never spoken and had anything actually appear. I can't even speak that the kitchen should be cleaned up and have it happen. But something shifts in Genesis chapter two. All of chapter one, God speaks and things appear. Genesis chapter two, verse seven says, God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a human being. God made it personal. Note, God didn't say let there be man. God got into the dust on the ground and formed this man. This same God knew you before he formed you. This same God knew your kids before he formed them. This same God knew you were the parent for them before he formed you and them. This should be such great news. You are enough because God says that you're enough. I feel like this pattern um, is repeated time after time after time in the New Testament. Jesus coming to the earth was pretty stinking personal. Jesus forming relationships with the disciples that was personal. In nearly all of Jesus' interactions, he made it personal. He stepped in and showed love to those who he interacted with. Jesus left the 99 to care for the one. You are that one. He turned his back on the crowds to care for one, to care for you. He turned his back on the crowds to care for you. 
there's a story um, that I think illustrates this very well. It's in Mark chapter 5, starting at verse 25, and it says, A large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all that she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. So on a side note, um, bleeding during that time was a barrier. It kept this woman from having a normal life. She would have been socially isolated. And she desperately wanted Jesus to heal her. But she knew that that bleeding could cause him to be unclean under Jewish law if she touched him. Can you imagine 12 years of being socially isolated? She was so desperate. So the story continues. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. She was so desperate and she knew that Jesus could heal her and all it would take was for her to touch him. Immediately, her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that the power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You guys, this is Jesus. I'm pretty sure he knew who touched his clothes. You see the people crowning against you, his disciple answers, and yet you ask, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. The disciples were like, Jesus, come on, there's a whole lot of crowds around here. Why are we stopping? People are touching you left and right. Keep going. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Jesus made it personal. He turned his crowd, his back to the crowd to seek the one. He called her daughter. There's not much more of a personal word that you can use than the word daughter. Jesus made it personal. So how do we stop the not enough monster from consuming our lives? How do we learn to live with peace with ourselves, with our parenting, and with our struggles? I believe that the second answer here is grace. We have to learn to forgive ourselves the way that Jesus forgave us. And I know what you're thinking. Jed, you work for a church. What do you need to be forgiven of? Like, you've got it figured out. You're doing great. That, that's not really accurate. Yes, I do work for a church. Um, you might ask, tell me, you don't know what I've done. And my reply to that would be, you don't know what I've done. I can promise you that if God can forgive me, if God can redeem my story for good, he's not done with you yet, and he has great plans for you. Your story has redemptive power through Jesus. I want to leave you with the most incredible example of God's grace, and this story is found in the Gospel of John. It starts at John chapter 8, verses 2. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts, where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. So the law at that time stated um, that both parties involved should be brought forth, but there's a double standard here um, where only the woman was brought forth. And I feel like in today's society and social media, we, we tend to be the judge and the jury ourselves when we're only seeing one side of the story. So carrying on. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. While they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. So Jesus knows the big picture. He knows what's going on. And he looks at the crowd and he says, Each one, any one of you who is without sin can throw the first stone. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first until only Jesus was left. 
the older ones probably because as we get older, we're more aware of our sins, and also the older you are, the more you've sinned. Until only Jesus was left. Hold on, can we go back? With the woman still standing there, Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? So it's this powerful moment. They're saying, Jesus, she did something wrong. Let's take care of her. And Jesus is just drawing in the sand. It says, if you haven't sinned, you may throw a stone. So moving on, it said, no one, sir, she said. So not one person was there. Not one person was left there that could judge her, that was sinless, that could, um, that could stone her. So carrying on. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. The only one who could judge her didn't even pick up a rock. Friends, let's just agree to cut each other some slack. And let's take that a step farther. Let's agree to cut ourselves some slack. You're not perfect. I'm not perfect. And the great thing is we don't have to be perfect. But remember, the only one who could cast judgment stood up from drawing in the dirt and told her that he does not condemn her. Go now and leave your life of sin. Didn't even pick up a stone, just showed her love and sent her on her way. You are enough because Jesus says that you're enough. So to wrap this up, how do we end our relationship with this not enough monster? I think we have two practical steps that we can take. Number one, make it personal. Step into people's lives. Get to know them. If you're not a parent, do you know any parents that you can step into their lives? Come along and say, hey, I know it doesn't feel like it, but you really are doing a great job. That frazzled mom of a toddler that you see at Target, just a smile and a word of encouragement. If you're feeling overwhelmed as a parent, reach out. There are other parents that are feeling the exact same way as you. We're just not posting it for everyone to see. And number two, extend some grace. You're scrolling through your social media feed and you're seeing all of the first day of school pictures. Maybe think about the families that aren't posting as much. What do you think is going on in their lives? <clears throat> For many of us, this feels impossible, taking down this monster, and especially in this corona season where nothing is normal and nothing is going like it was. Kind of our worlds have been turned upside down. How do we honor our jobs? By working the hours that we're supposed to work. How do we honor our families? By only working the hours that we're supposed to work. It, this cycle feels like an endless teeter-totter where you're the one that's constantly being slammed into the ground. Parents, I wholeheartedly believe that you are doing the best job that you are capable of. And even when it doesn't feel like it, and I'm also pretty sure that Jesus feels the same way. Hang in there. Tell that not enough monster to pack his bags. He's no longer welcome in our families, in our minds, and in our homes. You are enough because Jesus says that you're enough. Because while it feels like this not enough monster has enough stones lined up to take you down, my encouragement to you this week is this. Never forget that the only one who could possibly throw a stone didn't even pick one up. Friends, I hope that you have a great week. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we just, um, we thank you for this morning, God. We thank you for the opportunity um, to come together, even if it's not the way that we would like to do it. God, I pray for each and every family that's out there. God, I pray that, um, that you would lean into them, that they would feel the grace that you're extending to them. God, I pray that they would feel your love for them, that you made this personal by sending your son to the earth. God, I just pray um, our struggles, God, that we are able to lift them to you. We just love you so much, God, and it's in your holy name we pray. Amen.